Christi. Okay, well, first of all, Luca, thank you for inviting me. Uh, and uh, one of the things that's kind of interesting about this, this topic, because I was invited to speak on uh, historical epistemology in some sense, is that this has actually been very much part of my work from the very beginning, but I actually don't get invited very much to talk about this aspect of things. So in a sense, what I'm going to give you, and this is one of the reasons why I wanted the talk to be recorded, is a sense of where I come, how I come into this topic, because it was with me from the very beginning. So some of you who know uh, something about my background, um, I hold a PhD in, in history and philosophy of science from the University of Pittsburgh. And, and I got a, 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 I got an MPhil from Cambridge in a, similarly in history and philosophy of science. And so this is, it seems to me, the very, a very ideal field in which to talk about something like historical <coughs> epistemology, okay? Uh, and, and within both history and philosophy, there's always been this kind of tension, you might say, uh, with regard to how one uh, should combine the fields. And I've always been a person who has uh, supported a very sort of strong mix between the two, right? That they should be mutually influential, not one subordinate to the other, okay? Um, and, and it seems to me that this is kind of the way in which I enter into the spirit of historical epistemology, is that way. Um, now, the specific way I get into it has a lot to do with, the, with this thing that was mentioned uh, in the introduction about my having uh, been one of the founders of social epistemology. And, and, I, and I would say I was a founder in a very specific sense, namely in the sense that I think of it as an interdisciplinary field that is not reducible uh, either to sociology or to uh, philosophy. Uh, and in fact, this kind of historical dimension that I'm going to talk about here is actually integral in bringing about this so-called hybrid field. At least this is the way I think about it, okay? Because when you bring history into these kinds of considerations, all of a sudden, things seem a lot more fluid, okay? Um, and um, so that's where I'm coming from. Now, the reason why I call social epistemology epistemology is because at the end of the day, uh, my concerns about the nature of knowledge and the production of knowledge and so forth uh, are normative. Okay, and epistemology, as I understand it within philosophy, uh, is a normative theory of knowledge. How knowledge ought to be produced, ought to be uh, you know, looked into, how one should make judgments about what's true or false or whatever term you want to use. Uh, and um, this is kind of how I come into the topic. And so the relevance of history here uh, is in terms of our views about what ought to be the preferred form of knowledge, especially in terms of how knowledge ought to develop in the future, is very much conditioned by how we understand how knowledge got to be the way it is now. Okay? So that's the primary kind of intuition that I'm working from here. Um, and, and quite early in my work, if, you, if you've actually read my book, Social Epistemology, one of the things that you'll see is that I'm very much preoccupied uh, with counterfactuals. Okay? I mean, I, 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 people don't normally ask me to talk about this, but this is a very important point, namely that um, the fact that knowledge has developed the way it is, is that necessary? Or could it have been otherwise? And what's the implication of the difference? And those, to me, are normative questions, right? Uh, and they're normative questions that are very strongly influenced by our empirical understanding of how science has actually been produced, okay? Because if you have the view that, in a sense, science got to be the way it is uh, because it would have gotten that way no matter what happened, that's one kind of view, right? And it seems to me if you hold that kind of view, then it's very easy, in a way, to defend the way science is at the moment. Because, in a sense, you say, look, if you just, you know, regardless of your starting point, if you're really interested in getting at the truth, you'll end up here. Right? We could have maybe got, it, got there more quickly or something, but we've been, we would end up here. Okay? Now, that view I call an overdetermined view of the history of science. In other words, 
the history of science need not have proceeded the way it did, but it would have ended up where it has. So it doesn't matter, let's say, that Einstein was the one who came up with the theory of relativity or that Newton came up with the you know, universal law of gravitation, right? That Darwin came up with the theory of evolution by natural selection. In a sense, those are contingent. But what's necessary is that we would have ultimately arrived at a given truth. Okay? And I would submit to you that I think a lot of our, um, a lot of the normative basis and a lot of the authority on which um, not only natural science, but I would say academic knowledge generally, comes from conveying this kind of viewpoint implicitly, especially in pedagogy, in the way in which people are taught about their subject, right? That there's a sense in which, you know, look, you may think things may have been otherwise and could have done something different, but at the end of the day, once these people saw the full body of evidence and, and did all the relevant inquiries, they would have ended up in the same place. That's the overdetermined view. Okay, I think you understand what we're talking about here. Um, now, the other view uh, is the underdetermined view. And the underdetermined view basically says it's a historical accident. In a, in a very profound sense, that we, in fact, have got to the point that we've got to in the course of human knowledge. And that, in fact, had things gone differently at some point in the past, we would have ended up somewhere else. Okay? That's the underdetermined view. Um, now, the interesting thing about this, I mean, and, and so these views are clearly in, in tension with each other, the overdetermined and the underdetermined view. And they both involve a kind of management of contingency and necessity. Right? Because the underdetermined view is also committed to a kind of necessity, and it's the kind of necessity that we uh, in economics talk about as path dependency. Right? Once you've started at one place, this is the only place you can go to. Okay? Um, and my view of, now path dependency is a term that when economic, economists talk about it, they're usually talking about it in the context of the history of technology, okay? So in other words, we talk about different ways in which, let's say, the typewriter keyboard could have been. We talk about different ways in which the automobile could have been designed or produced. We talk about different ways in which a bicycle could have been uh, designed, right? In fact, for most important human inventions, when you go to the beginning, okay, that usually are options on the table about how this invention might go forward, and it would have different implications, not only from the design standpoint of the invention, but also from the standpoint of, you know, who's empowered and who's not empowered and, you know, economics of it in terms of where your resources would be spent. There are all these different issues that are implicated, but at some point there's what the uh, economists call locking. Okay? Locking. At that point you sort of settle on one option, all the competitors are eliminated relatively quickly, and then that, that successful option then starts to set the standard by which the future proceeds. And then over time, that gets seen as necessary. So you, so you know, if you let enough years pass and people don't remember and aren't told about what was actually available in the past, people end up not knowing about it, right? So they think, well, the reason why we have the cars the way we do Right? The reason why we have the typewriter keyboard the way we do is because, in some sense, that must have been the most efficient way, that must have been the best way. Right? There are all these normative things that are attached to it. But of course, this is kind of a, a process, you might say, that involves not only restricting all the other options that were available at the beginning, but also talking about the current option in increasingly necessitarian terms. Right? So in other words, you start to build the normative value into the thing that's been chosen. And, and again, this is because the thing that's been chosen sets the standard by which everything else that might be a competitor is judged. Okay? Now, 
So this is how I get into the topic. Now, of course, some of you who know something about my work know also that I've spent a lot of my time um, thinking and, and criticizing uh, Thomas Kuhn, okay? And so Thomas Kuhn, as you know, has this kind of idea of a paradigm, all right? A paradigm. Now, a paradigm is scientific lock-in, right? What the history of technology is talking about is locking, where options get eliminated and one gets focused on and then gets kind of entrenched over successive generations. That is what Kuhn calls a paradigm. Okay? Um, and um, now the way, you, the way you can tell that this is in fact how Kuhn is thinking about it is what I regard as actually his most important, you know, most kind of incisive you might say, contribution to the whole discourse on the history and philosophy of science. And that's what he talks about, the Orwellian way in which new scientists are taught their history. Right? So, he, so a scientific paradigm like Newtonian mechanics lasts for two centuries, okay? From the late uh, the 17th century to the late 19th century, basically, two centuries, Okay, how does this paradigm get its forward momentum? How does it, you know, even though there are all kinds of objections to fundamental things from the beginning, and, the, and these objections continue, actually. So, for example, Newton believes in absolute space and time that can be the basis for some kind of uh, objective notion of causation, uh, and he has objections from the beginning, and the objections continue, but they don't count. They're treated as merely philosophical. They are not treated as scientific. Now, um, how does this happen from the standpoint of people actually practicing science? How do they come to also acquire this belief? Well, it has a lot to do with how their history is told. Right? So when, and so Kuhn makes a big deal about this, right? About the, that for, for, for Kuhn, you might say the scientific lock-in happens at the pedagogical level when a new recruit to a science gets taught their history as part of an introductory course, let's say. And the idea here is that you're told that um, actually there is this very relatively direct connection between where we started from and where we are now. Okay? And of course there have been people complaining and criticizing but those people don't really matter because look at all the success that we have managed to accumulate in terms of solving problems over the many centuries in which this paradigm has been in effect. So in other words, the burden of proof in terms of the historiography is always put on the opponent. Right? So in other words, there's, you know, once there's the paradigm, once there's the scientific lock-in, there is no longer any incentive or any institutionalized means by which new alternative options can be introduced, including ones that actually exist already. Okay, so it's not like you have to invent stuff, right? It's more a matter of closer to censorship. The stuff's there, but no one's taking it seriously. Okay? Um, and for Kuhn, this is a good thing. And this is where my criticism of Kuhn comes from, because the whole point, the punchline of Kuhn, is that this kind of Orwellian rewriting of the past to make it look as though the science is always heading toward wherever, it's, wherever it is at the moment, right, uh, is in fact a kind of, you know, uh, institutionalized form of self-censorship. Right? That's what it ma and what it amounts to is eliminating most of the history. So you only get this kind of streamlined version of the history. Okay? Um, now, when Kuhn was writing, um, it was quite common to talk about this as Whiggish history. And again, uh, just let me remind, I mean, you may have heard this term, the idea of Whig history. Uh, just to remind you what this is, right? This is the kind of history that started to be told about the history of Britain um, once uh, Parliament became sovereign over the monarch, right? So that the history of Britain becomes the story of liberty, right? Story of liberty. 
Uh, and, and so everything that has taken place before then is seen as somehow building up to it or an obstacle to it, but the point is, the truth is that we are free people and this is how you tell the history. That is the Whig, so-called Whig interpretation of history, okay? Now what Kuhn adds to this idea uh, in, I, I think, a very interesting way, though I don't think he meant it at all to be critical. He actually provides a kind of deconstruction of the idea by calling it Orwellian. Okay, so it's no longer simply a matter of, you know, as it were, just simply privileging the things that you think are important in your past, but rather spinning everything else so that they're excluded, right? So they seem less plausible, less viable, Right, so you increase the appearance of necessity as time goes on in the initial decision that was taken to, let's say, support a given paradigm. Okay, that's the idea, right? Uh, and, uh, and, and the ultimate in this, of course, is to say that had anyone else, you know, if you had a free sense of inquiry, not with no obstacles, with no superstition, with no religion, with no tradition, they would have reached exactly the same conclusion we would have reached. Okay? So in other words, you are creating this sense of an overdetermined history by masking the underdetermination of it. Right? By masking the fact that we're really talking about a path-dependent historical accident. Okay? Um, now, this kind of insight, to me, uh, the place where it's, you know, has been very interesting to kind of look at this, has been in terms of what's called uh, the Needham thesis. And again, I don't know uh, if you're familiar with this. Um, Joseph Needham uh, was uh, a chemist, uh, a as was the case, uh, I would say, within a large amount of the uh, natural science community in the middle third of the 20th century, a Marxist, okay, uh, and, and a person of the kind of radical science persuasion. And um, one of the things that he was interested in looking at, so he's a person who's trained in chemistry, um, but he, uh, he, he was a kind of amateur historian, and, and you may know him as the guy who wrote these m large number of volumes, nine or 10 volumes, on science and civilization in China, in China. Uh, and he learned Chinese, and he did all that kind of stuff. Uh, but the Needham thesis is uh, the idea that, uh, this, you know, after having studied all this Chinese stuff and studied the West as well, he came to the conclusion that modern science as we know it would not have arisen in China had it not arisen in the West. Right? That's the conclusion. So in other words, he's arguing for a very underdetermined kind of understanding about the rise of modern science. Now this is striking. Um, it's striking uh, for many reasons, one of which is uh, from a, a general kind of political economy standpoint, uh, which, is, which is kind of how Marxists and other people often approach the matter. Uh, China was generally seen as the most developed country in the world, uh, empire, if you will, uh, until the late 18th, maybe early 19th century. This is still pretty much a greed point, okay? And, and, and certainly in terms of pure technological development, in terms of being able to do things, right? Uh, you know, in terms of doing things in particular domains, China was superior to the West for a long time. But of course, that's not sufficient for talking about science. For talking about science, one has to start bringing in things like having a kind of uh, worldview, which involves thinking that the uh, world is a rational place overall, and that there's some kind of unified understanding of the world to be gotten, the kind of thing that we normally associate with physics, right? And this is something the Chinese did not have. They did not have this impulse. They did not have this motivation. So even though they were very good as empirical inquirers, and indeed not only empirical inquirers, but also were interested in you know, helping the human condition, so they created all these new innovative technologies within specific domains. What they lacked 
was this kind of overarching worldview, right, which said that all of this stuff can be resolved into a few set of principles which human beings can grasp. And not only one, and once they grasp those principles, they can then be turned to even greater sources of power. Right? Because this is the thing, right? The, the whole thing about modern science, in terms of you know, what it means, you might say, in terms of a general historical standpoint, is whether you think it's good or bad, what's happened in the history of modern science, it's been about guys like Newton coming up with the notion that everything in the universe could be explained by very few principles, mathematical principles, and once we grasp those principles, we can then redeploy them in some way to reconstruct the universe in our own image and likeness. That's the basic thrust. Now, I put it in this kind of way because the thing that the Chinese lacked, and this is what Needham does draw attention to. So Needham is a Marxist. He's not a Christian. But he does draw to this kind of unified you know, worldview that you get in Christianity through the image and likeness doctrine in the Bible. Human beings are created in the image and likeness of God, and God's the creator. That's a very straightforward relationship. Okay? Now, to be sure, within Christianity, and Islam as well, and other religions that have, you know, in the Abrahamic mode, that have versions of this doctrine, there are different ways of interpreting it. So it's not like, you know, if you hold the Bible, you'll end up becoming Newton. It's not that straightforward. But nevertheless, there is this kind of initial assumption, which somebody like St. Augustine, for example, paid a lot of attention to. Namely, what does it mean for us to be created in the image and likeness of God, where God is the creator? Can we ourselves create the universe? What would that mean? And so all of this stuff that you start to see coming within the Christian West, right, in the Middle Ages even, about modeling the world, modeling, right, coming up with a microcosm and a macrocosm, all this kind of stuff, even before we get to people like Galileo and Newton, okay? Why would people even think this? Because it's very common within uh, cosmologies of many cultures in the world, and this includes the Chinese culture, where there is a kind of creative force, a spirit, whatever. That's very common. What's not so common is to think that this creative sport, force or spirit has some kind of uh, privileged relationship, or humans have some privileged relationship to it. Right? So typically, when one talks about the creative force, in, in most of these cosmologies, it's irrational, right, from the standpoint of the human, right, that it's not the sort of thing a human being could ever fathom. That's the normal stance, right? The West, at least the Abrahamic West, in particular the Christian West, is distinctive in thinking that somehow this force and us, we're related to each other. And of course, the thing that, you know, helps in Christianity is Jesus as the core point. Right? And so there's a, you know, and, and this is something that I think makes it very delicate, a very delicate issue in the times in which we live, right? That there's a sense in which what makes Christianity particularly a kind of lightning rod on this issue, right? A kind of a, deli a difficult issue is because Christianity actually says there actually was a person who explicitly mediated between God and humans in a very direct kind of way, not simply as a vessel but as someone who, in a sense, had the ca character of God in themselves. And this becomes, of course, very important for the very proactive view of the world that scientists start to adopt in the modern era. Right? Because, again, you think about this. Compare this to Muhammad, for example, in Islam. Right? Muhammad presents himself as a vessel into which God de deposits himself, basically. Okay, and whatever happens after that, right, is God's word, and, and Muhammad is basically a medium. Right, Muhammad is not an independent agent. Jesus is an independent agent, and that's made very clear in the Gospels. Okay, so what this does then is it creates this kind of idea that, um, that human beings, by some, how, somehow, are in a position, at least in principle, to do what God does, okay? And I think that if you look at the aspirations and the activities that have been done in the name of modern science, 
this is the best way to explain it. Okay, so in other words, it's this kind of self-understanding that human beings have about themselves that would actually lead to all of this, that, you know, really radical kind of transformation of not only the uh, empirical world and our but ourselves as well, right? And all the sort of various transformations we have undergone over the last three, four hundred years. It's this kind of idea. And Needham was getting at this, okay? So in other words, there's a sense in which you need a certain kind of metaphysical view about the way in which human beings relate to whomever is the creator uh, in order to actually have science develop in this kind of way. Now, of course, what happens in the modern era is that things like the church and, you know, religious tradition and all of this starts, it drops out. A lot of this drops out, but the impulse remains. And so in this respect, there is a kind of path dependency, right? In other words, once you start to believe that you're creating the image and likeness of God, it doesn't matter which church you go to, doesn't matter whether you believe what the Pope says, doesn't matter any of that stuff, it sticks. And that's a very distinct, distinctive point of view that is not characteristic of the world's cosmologies and certainly was not characteristic of China. Okay? Now, I happen to think this is more or less true, okay, for what it's worth. Um, but of course you could see this being played in various ways. And it, in fact, it was played various ways historically. Because I would say it's this point of view which, uh, in fact, was very instrumental uh, in imperialism, and especially the missionary side of imperialism, okay? Um, and and I, I don't want to go into it in any detail here, but I do think uh, that um, one of the things that is really striking about once people start to have this point of view uh, is the extent to which they want to promote it, and they want to get, because they believe that if you don't actually believe you know, in the Gospels, if you don't actually believe in Jesus and so forth, you're never going to be able to rise to the occasions you need to get to. Get to. And this is something you already start to see in the 16th century. And it motivates a lot of the, the missionary work into China and other places uh, where the Chinese, you know, deal with it with the kind of mixed responses you can imagine. Um, and, and, and nevertheless, it carries on, of course, and by the 19th century, it becomes foreign policy right across the Western world. Um, and, and again, and, and so people who now today argue from a post-colonial standpoint, right, will point to this, right? They'll point to exactly what I'm talking about, except they won't spin it positively. They'll spin it negatively. They'll say, look, it's the imposition of this path-dependent kind of view of science that has, in fact, led to all the oppression and misery and so forth that's in the world today. And had we not been saddled with these kinds of Christian cosmological views, we would live in a much more secure, safer, better place. So in other words, these post-colonial critics, in a sense, agree with the Needham thesis too. Right? They believe that, in fact, it is a moment in Western history colored by certain kinds of conceptions of the world and so forth. And the reason why these colonized the world became the universal idea isn't because it was in itself true, but rather because you Christianized everybody. I mean, so that that was the idea. So you imposed this sense of path dependency on everyone. Okay? Um, now, people who hold this view also generally don't believe that there is any kind of one truth that is in some sense obscured by this, rather they believe that there are multiple truths that ought to be allowed to flourish. So I think that's an important point to say about this kind of post-colonial argument, right? That it's not like there's some other truth that is being masked. It's, it's rather the idea that we think it's one truth comes from this kind of path dependency of the history of science, okay? Now, it seems to me that, that this kind of view, that, that, you know, the way I'm talking about the way in which we, because you, you have to say, okay, on what basis then do we justify science now? Now, you might say, well, you know, the way to justify science is in terms of the results it produces and the, and, and the efficacy, you know, that it, 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 
even if you might even want to claim technology as part of the basis on which one justifies the pursuit of science. But the problem is, of course, what kind of history are we talking about here that gives you this kind of view? Namely, it's this path-dependent view, where basically the scientific establishment claims responsibility or claims ownership, I think that's a better word here, ownership, over everything good that's happened as a result of the application of science. And that the implication is it could not have been brought about any other way in the cases in which things are good. Okay? So I think that there's that, so, so the idea that, that science as it's currently being conducted can be justified on pragmatic grounds or consequential grounds, it really, uh, on, it's only persuasive if you accept an Orwellian thesis with regard to the history of science, because what you're not investigating is the other ways in which science might have proceeded and what could have come about from that. Okay? Um, at least that's the way it's normally presented. Now let me, let me just say one point here. I am not a skeptic about historical causation or counterfactuals or anything like that. I actually think we can argue about these points. In other words, I think we can, make an, we can argue one way or another whether uh, we would have been in a better world had we not taken the Newtonian turn. I think this is something we could argue about by looking at what the histories would have been of all these other places. What we just need to decide on is the, the point in the past that we would have to rewind to. Okay? Um, and I think this is a kind of a important point when one thinks about counterfactuals. Is that um, if there is a sense in which there is this decisive moment where somehow the trajectories of history split off and, one, and, and it ends up that one becomes very dominant, uh, it becomes really important to identify that moment. So where, so because obviously the idea that um, humans are created in the image and likeness of God is something that was very much in the beginning of Christianity, arguably even there in Judaism as well, since it's Genesis that's usually quoted as being the source for <coughs> being created in the image and likeness of God. So Judaism is, is certainly implicated there. And, and yet, this view only starts to matter in a decisive way at a certain point when? Mid to late Middle Ages, maybe, when theologians start to think in different ways about what this means, what this phrase means that we're creating the image and likeness of God, and start to come up with a much more proactive attitude. Um, if you're interested in this topic, I can say something about it, but I don't want to spend too much time just giving you my view about what, what that is. But the key point here from a methodological standpoint, if you're doing historical epistemology, is that you have to kind of imagine rewinding the history. You have to get to the point where the difference matters, where you start to get a separation of positions, where, it, where people start acting in such a way that you're going down a certain sort of path. And, and, and this, kind of, this kind of way of, of, of thinking about uh, counterfactuals, because this is what's, what's going to be important if you want to uh, make an argument that we should have, in fact, not gone down this path, you have to say, OK, at what point could we have stopped it? You have to find a point. And then you start arguing, what would the alternative look like? So this is what the, the task is for the critic, as it were. So, you can, so the critic can grant that, in fact, we need not have gone down the path of modern science. But then the question is, when did, we, when did the fork in the road become, in a sense, irreversible? When, at one point, at what point, did we go down a way we could never return to, and as a result, we got stuck in a certain fashion? Okay? Um, now, this kind of argument uh, is one that's actually very familiar to economic historians. We don't talk about it very much in the history of science or the history of knowledge or anything like that. Um, but, but it is a very familiar notion in the, in the, in the his economic history. And, and here, uh, you know, I would mention the name of a Nobel Prize winner in economics, Robert Fogel, um, University of Chicago, who um, you know, he got his Nobel Prize for this, basically, by actually trying to think about 
um, you know, making, because there is a tendency in, in economics, as you know, if you know something about economics, to kind of um, over, you know, kind of make everything look a bit more overdetermined than it really is, right? I think this is, I think, a general statement that can be made about economics, right? So in other words, if we're where we are now, it's because it's the most efficient way to be, right? A kind of overdetermined view. So no matter where you begin, equilibrium will hit at some point. That's a very natural way for economists to think. But Fogel, uh, in a way, wanted to come up with a, a, a sort of way of nuancing this, right? In other words, um, well, how can we make judgments whether we're, in fact, in the most efficient place? Can't we do it in some independent way? And so he was the one who came up with this idea of doing counterfactual historiographies. So let me just give you if, you, if you, if you're not familiar with this line of research, which I think, you know, I became familiar with it because uh, when I was a student, and this was like 40 years ago now, I, I read, um, you know, John Elster's book, Logic and Society. I don't know if you've, ever, you, do you know who John Elster is, a social political philosopher? Um, and one of his early books is called Logic and Society. I recommend this book. This is what really opened my eyes to this. Um, and, and he talks about Fogel. The point is he talks about Fogel. And, and, and for those of you, this is in like 1978, this book came out. And, and, and for those of you who were around back then, um, this was the period when you might say it was kind of high watermark in terms of different kinds of understandings of counterfactuals were on the table, courtesy of the two Princeton professors at the time, both logicians, Wright and Saul Kripke, um, and David Lewis. I'm not sure, I'm sure you know who these guys are, right? Um, and and, and, and the, the, both of their theories of counterfactuals came up at this time uh, under the rubric of possible worlds, Right, possible worlds might be the way you understand this. Um, and Kripke, in particular, had actually a, a way of understanding uh, possible worlds in terms of branching off from the actual world, which is, in fact, the relevant sense for what we're talking about here. Because Lewis, again, you may know this already, but Lewis's view of possible worlds and how you kind of scale them is in terms of similarity of the worlds themselves, regardless of how they're generated. So he treats them as kind of inherent properties of the world, and then you sort of line them up and you compare them in terms of their inherent properties. But Kripke saw possible worlds as a branching off from the actual world, different ways in which the actual world could be otherwise. And that gives you a different sense of what possible worlds are about. Now that sense, Kripke's sense, is the one that, I, that Elster argues, and I agree, uh, is uh, the relevant one for understanding you know, counterfactuals in the historical context, overdetermination, underdetermination, things like this. You want to understand where the branching occurs. And so Robert Fogel is someone who clearly, even though Robert Fogel, as far as I understand, doesn't know much about Kripke, but nevertheless, his, his implicit notion of, of, of what we're talking about when we talk about possible worlds and, and you know, alternative ways in which economic history should have gone is in this Kripkean bank. Because he goes back to a point. So his famous case, the case that really got him famous, was about the introduction of the railroads in the United States. Okay? Um, it's generally agreed that um, railroads made a big difference in the United, you know, the United States, a big country, 3,000 miles from coast to coast, all this kind of thing. Um, and so what was it that enabled the country to kind of consolidate as an economic powerhouse in the late 19th century? Uh, and it was the introduction of railroads, this kind of transcontinental railroads, okay? Um, and, and that's understood. Now the question is, would the United States, this is the question Fogel posed, would the United States have overall reached the same GDP had railroads not been introduced? In other words, you would talk about other things that were on the pipeline, like uh, the United States already had a very uh, advanced kind of river-based transport system, canals and things like this, very, you know, in, in very big scale. Uh, and, and that was the main competitor, actually. Um, and, um, and so what, what Fogel does is he goes back to 1830, 1830 being the date at which, in a sense, the commitment de facto got made, and the US went down the railroad route. 
and, and then imagine, okay, let's say it went the other way, when it was still a free choice, right? The idea is you go to the, the point about the crossroads is you have to go to a point where there's a kind of free choice that's available to the parties making the decision. So that's where you have to go back to when you're rewinding the history. You go to the point where, you know, it could go either way, not where it's already biased one way. That's the idea. And he said, well, look, in 1830, it could have gone either way. So suppose it went the other way. Suppose it went the way of uh, water transport and canals and things like that. What would the GDP of the United States have been in 1890, 60 years later? And his argument was it would be the same, but the distribution of resources and which cities were important and all that kind of micro stuff would have been different, but the macro conclusion would have been the same. So, for example, Chicago is a city that was built on railroads. Had there not been railroads, Chicago would not have been important, but another city 250 miles away to the south, which was at the place where the two biggest rivers in the United States met, the Missouri and the Mississippi, and I'm talking about St. Louis, would have been the Chicago-like city, right? The second city in the country. Okay? So, so this is interesting, right? You can, you can, you can, you can disagree with the, you know, the analysis and so forth, but the point is he kind of gives you what the alternative world would look like, and then you can make a judgment for yourself as to whether it would have been better and so forth. And then, Later on, and this was even more controversial, um, he took on the idea that the reason, an, an idea that was very popular among Marxists, that the reason why the slave economy collapsed in the United States in the 1860s was because it wasn't economically efficient. Right? So the, the Marxist argument about the collapse of the slave economy is that basically the capitalist economy killed it. Right? That's, so you move from feudalism to capitalism, a very straightforward kind of Marxist story. And he looked at this and he said, well, actually, actually, had there not been a civil war, which led to the emancipation of the slaves and all the rest of it, had there not been a civil war, and it's not clear, let's say, in 1850, 10 years before the war starts, whether there would be a war, right? It, it was pretty much unclear until pretty close to the end whether there would be a war, a civil war, that in fact the slave economy could have survived, could have flourished, and that in fact some of the slaveholders were already using more modern agricultural techniques. In fact, the treatment of blacks in the, in, in the, in the slave plantations were arguably better than what was happening in the North where they were, quote, free. Right, there were all these issues at play. So it was entirely possible. From, from, from the standpoint of, of, of what Fogel's analysis, that there was nothing necessary in history to have stopped the slave trade from an economic standpoint. There was nothing necessary from an economic standpoint. And his judgment is that the reason why, and this is something that's it's kind of unpopular with Marxists, but, but, but it might be interesting to philosophers, uh, is that it was because there were a lot of people campaigning against slavery. In other words, the idea Right? And, and all the political movement that you could get on the back of the idea that people should not be slaves, that actually did make a difference. Because there wasn't really that clear an economic argument for freeing the slaves. Okay? Um, now, you see, that's that, 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 the, the book where he wrote this, uh, Time on the Cross, very controversial book. Uh, but a very interesting book from the standpoint of what we're talking about here, okay? So this again gives you a kind of different, uh, see, what's the point of doing all these counterfactual histories and so forth? Is that I think what it does is it provides a kind of, a test of your normative sensibilities, right? And so if you're against slavery, you know, and you believe it was good that in fact slavery stopped in the United States, um, there's a sense in which what you're endorsing, you know, if you're endorsing this, um, you need to really go beyond economic arguments. You actually need to actually support the intellectual argument for being against slavery. Because it's not clear on the economic arguments that slavery would have been stopped. Okay, so, so, so there's a normative implication that's built in here, right? Um, how much time do I have to say? Oh. 
quarter of an hour. Okay, okay. Um, now, so I, I think I've given you a sense of kind of what the, this kind of historical epistemology I'm scoping out. And what I, what I want to, the way I, uh, when I first introduced this um, in an early book of mine, uh, you know, if you ever, Philosophy of Science and Its Discontents. This is a book that came out in the late 80s originally. Um, I actually start talking about this even then, okay? Um, and, uh, and there I talked about a field, an, a fictitious field that I would like to invent, a kind of experimental science, you might say, um, called axio etiotics. So it's bringing together the idea of causation and values, if you go back to the Greek. Okay? Axio etiotics. And what's the idea? The idea here is to test what people's intuitions would be if they suddenly found that something that they thought had to happen the way it did actually didn't happen, have to happen the way it did. Could have been otherwise, could have been different. How would that affect your value attachment to the thing concerned? Right? This is what we're talking about. Because our notion of what we think is valuable and important and needs to be preserved has a lot to do with the way in which we think things got brought about and how they could have been brought about. But if you change that, if you say it's just a historical accident, what people had thought was necessary to happen, then their value orientation toward it may shift. Okay? Um, now there's a, while no one's ever taken up this kind of, so, so it's a kind of a, uh, my, my, uh, my inspiration for this kind of idea uh, comes from psychophysics, actually. Um, I, I don't know if you know what psychophysics is. It's, uh, so psychophysics is the original branch of experimental psychology in the mid-19th century. And the idea is to figure out, so you've got, you've got stimuli, stimuli in the form of, uh, of sounds, of vision, and then you want to get a sense of how the subject, when does the subject perceive a difference, right? So you're raising the, 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 the volume of the sound, at what point do they hear it as loud? At what point do they hear it you know, as different from the way it was before? You look for the sensory threshold where you're imagining a kind of continuous physical stimuli. Now this idea, which was uh, advanced uh, in the 19th century by uh, Gustav Fechner, the philosopher, you know, uh, psychologist, um, was, uh, was this idea, he was trying to calibrate at what, he was trying to solve the mind-body problem, basically, okay? He was trying to figure out at what point does a physical thing lead to a mental thing, right? That's kind of what he was looking for. And so you raise the volume, you know, uh, and then at what point do I hear it differently? At what point do I hear it a certain way, okay? Now, I was trying to do something, this is what I kind of, the spirit in which I'm proposing this, namely that I believe that actually our notions of what we consider valuable is actually very closely tied to how, how necessary we think they are, okay? And that if one modulates that, right, so turn the necessary into contingent and vice versa, people will have quite different intuitions as, insofar as what is valuable. I'll give you just a straight statistic. If this intuition isn't clear to you, death, supposing it's reversible, what value does it then have if it's reversible? Because, you know, some of you may know I, I deal a lot with transhumanism and so forth, right? And, and not only do these people want to stop death, but they also admit, well, you know, we may, we may kill you, but kill death, in that sense, may be a temporary arrangement that we could then revive you from by giving you some new cells or implanting something in you or something like that. So that death becomes reversible. It's not necessary. If death is not necessary, what becomes, you know, the, 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 you think about the normative standing that death has in philosophy, right? For some people, Heidegger, Kierkegaard, other, these existentialist guys, right? The being unto death, that's where the action is in terms of defining the human condition. But what if you say, death isn't the end? There's a reverse. You can, you can come back alive again. Okay? That changes things. Okay? That changes how one thinks about death, right? 
Now, um, so, so I do think that there's a sense in which this kind of idea, that, that the, you know, the degree to which we think something is necessary or contingent, does affect the values that we place on it. Now, I'm going to be the first one to admit that this is a complicated story. So if you actually go into the details of how necessity and contingency relate to values, it's not going to be a one-to-one -one thing, OK? Uh, but nevertheless, I do think that there, it does end up shifting the ground very strongly, OK? Um, so there, now, let me bring this story into the topic that, that in a way maybe makes you most interested about what I'm saying, and that has to do with the, the standing of academic knowledge, OK? Um, I think academics, you know, we live in a time, as you know, so-called post-truth time, a time when expertise is being questioned and so forth. And here I would pose, point out the following, that what we call expertise uh, is in fact uh, heavily reliant on path-dependent notions how knowledge is acquired. Okay, so in other words, um, there, the reason why the, the, at least the, you might say, the, the assumption, the mental assumption that's made by people who trust expertise is that, look, you know, in order to acquire, in order to be at the point where the expert can say what they say, they have had to go through a very specific kind of education and training, and they would have had to learn very specific kind of things, and this takes a long time, and not everyone can do it. In other words, you stress the path dependency of the epistemic process. Okay? Um, and the questioning of expertise that we see now in our society is rejecting this, basically. It's rejecting the idea that there is such path dependent notions of knowledge. Now, where does this come from? Of course, you know, I mean, I, there are a lot of reasons why it comes. Part of it has to do with people, more people getting better educated and not necessarily being part of the academic establishment. So there's this kind of spillover effect, you might say. Uh, but also the internet as a kind of living example of how it's possible, as it were, to approach topics from many different angles to get at what one needs to know. So in other words, the internet is a living example of breaking down path dependency, because if you're interested in a topic, you can get into it at any level you want. You don't have to take the undergraduate course. You don't have to get a PhD in the subject. You can, you can begin to get into it at the level at which you understand it. That breaks the path dependency, OK? Um, and so this then leads to a question about what universities ought to be up to these days. Because I do think there is this maybe taken for granted view, uh, and I would say it's a very lazy view, uh, that academics often have that, you know, we're the place where expertise is produced reproduced, and, and, and that this is where our authority comes from, and, and this is how, at the end of the day, we stave off the bar barbarians, right? We, we're the ones who know stuff, because we went through the process by which you know things, okay? Um, I don't think that's going to work, okay? Um, and in fact, I think the way in which universities need to sell themselves, and the way academics need to sell themselves, uh, you know, in terms of what it is to actually embrace what I regard as kind of the, the growth pains of democratization, which is to say that we have to get more used to the idea that people can come to forms of knowledge that they find valuable by their own means. And part of what academics should be doing is actually presenting material that may in fact have taken them many, many years to acquire knowledge of, present them in a way that actually does make it as accessible as possible to people to be able to get into it and do what they will with it. And that may involve reverse engineering our expertise, okay? In other words, make something that at the moment seems you know, you have to go through this path in order to get to this form of knowledge. Deconstruct that. Try to get to the conclusion in a different way, in a quicker way, which means that you actually have to know something about who your students are. This is a form of knowledge academics aren't necessarily very good at. That is to say, you have to understand your audience so you know what exactly it would, 
me to take a form of knowledge that you have acquired by going through a specific path, how to make that available to someone who hasn't gone through that path? And who are these people who you're, in fact, trying to impart the knowledge to? So it's going to involve that, actually. It's going to involve a kind of greater understanding of the audience, of the market, as, you were, as it were. But that, it seems to me, is what a university, in principle, uh, is very well set up to do. Because you do have this captive audience of students who do want to get knowledge. All of this is already on the table. The question is, what is the nature of the knowledge that's being imparted to them? And it's by no means obvious that we need to be in the business of reproducing in the students the way in which we came to the knowledge ourselves. If anything, we should make it easier for them than it was for ourselves. And then they can take it in whatever directions they want. Okay? This seems to me very core to the idea of the democratization of knowledge. And I think it's very mindful of the fact that the kinds of knowledge that we have now that are dominant are not necessarily the ones we could have had or would have had under different circumstances. And so this is the way in which I would say a kind of historical epistemology ought to feed into the pedagogical process. Okay? Uh, and I think I will stop here and, and open it to questions. Is that okay? Okay. 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 Well, thank you. <laughs> yes. Thank you, Steve, for, for yeah, question time. Yes, okay. yes, you. Just me. <laughs> yes, you, you. You were the first one. Now. Okay, thanks. Um, I enjoyed that very much. Mm -hmm. first thing. Uh, I was wondering, so to which extent you think that the um, distinction between knowing how and knowing that might be useful for, for what you were talking about, especially towards the end when you were talking from about expertise. I have the impression that it's rather um, uh, the knowing how, how um, part of, of knowledge um, so that comes into play here. and. Um, uh, uh, it's related to the undetermined um, view of, uh, of the acquisition of knowledge, um, whereas the, what um, guys like Newton have in mind, so the word formula um, is rather the word that uh, thing. And I was also wondering, so that's the first question, and the second question would be, so, um, uh, so you, you started um, with uh, saying that um, we should uh, understand uh, um, Epistemology and knowledge are rather in a normative way. So you, you're actually not talking really about truthness and falseness anymore, you're talking about what's right and wrong in virtue of certain criteria. Yes. Right? Yes. So, so this is, um, but when you were uh, talking about the overdetermined view, so with the word formula, it seems to be, um, uh, yeah, to which extent is it then still uh, tied to criteria in a normative way? Because it's, actually the aim is to be completely detached, but how can it be detached at all? I mean, you are still using some kind of normative language in order to phrase the, the formula in the end. So, so, um, yeah. And I'm, I'm wondering so, so how, how, how it helps how it fits. Yeah, yeah, no, no, that's, those are good questions. Let me take the last one first about the overdetermined, underdetermined, and how that plays into the normative idea. Yeah. Um, I think that there's a, there's a kind of rhetorical bait and switch. If you know this phrase in English, I don't know. bait and switch, where you, where you sort of tell people one thing, but in fact you're doing something else, right? <laughs> bait and switch. Um, and I, I think the idea here is that when, when, when the history of a field is being presented, a field of knowledge is being presented, it is usually presented in an overdetermined way. In other words, any intelligent person would have reached the conclusions we've reached, and in that respect, the history doesn't matter, right? right? Because in a sense, anyone, and we can show how, right? Uh, uh, but in fact, right, what you're trying to do, and, and, so, and so in that respect, that kind of stops the normative inquiry in a way, because, you so, because the competence gets, gets uh, associated very directly with your believing this is the only way it could be. Right? So, so as were, when you learn the facts, you've learned the truth in a, norm, in a strong normative sense, with the overdetermined view. But in fact, what I'm arguing is that you know, the way you recover the normative character of this is to show how contingent it was that we actually got to this place. In other words, you go back to the history, you say how the history could have been otherwise, and what that does is it then opens up a question of choice. Was it the right thing to have done? Was it the right thing to have gone down this path rather than this path? 
You see, because that then makes it a uh, proper, it makes the normativity of it quite explicit because there, there's a choice between options. It's not being presented as just a sort of accomplished fact. Okay, so, so that's what I would say about, so, so there's a, it's, it's an issue in, in how, uh, in, in the rhetoric of pedagogy, you might say, because I think the rhetoric of pedagogy stops the normative inquiry when it's presented as overdetermined, when in fact it's underdetermined. And when you reveal the underdetermined nature of the way knowledge develops, then you see the normative character very explicitly. Right? So you have to self-deconstruct in this way. And that's why I talk about reverse engineering expertise. It's the same kind of idea. Now, the first thing you raised, the knowing that versus knowing how, um, that's an interesting issue. Because let's put it this way. Um, it's possible to know how to do something, right? But the way you explain that you know how to do something uh, may not be the right way, in a sense, right? In other words, you may, so, so, so in other words, the knowing how, um, in, a, in a sense, uh, can be understood through many different knowing that's. Okay, you see what I'm saying, right? So some of some of which are explicit to you, so conscious to you, and others are not. Well, right. I mean, yeah. I mean, because look, the point is that um, if 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 I, if I know not, you know, do I need to know Newtonian mechanics to know that if I step outside a window from a fifth-story building? I'm going to die or something? Do I need to know Newtonian mechanics to do that? So in other words, I got to kind of, there's a knowing how there that isn't necessary. You know, my explanation may not be very good from a physicist's standpoint. So the knowing that side of this is not too hot, but the knowing how side of it is good because I'm doing kind of the right thing. And, and I do think that there's a sense in which that's how this, this thing I'm talking about plays out, right? Where there's a sense in which you know, there are certain, there, there are forms of knowledge that we have in the world, knowing hows, that actually don't require the knowing that's that we have of the world. The knowing that is when you start talking about the colonizing of knowledge, where certain kinds of accounts or theories become privileged in accounting for the knowing how. You see what I'm saying? Yeah. Um, usually, when people are talking about expertise, so they are talking, especially in high enterprise and People are explicit uh, about the knowing that. So they first need to learn consciously and very explicitly. Yeah. So, and then it becomes a, a more local. Yeah, but see, that's a superficial and notion of expertise. He seems to, yeah, and there, there seem to be different kinds of known power. Yeah, yeah. So the known how you were just talking about so has not reached um, the, the explicit level at, at, at all. Right. So that's a different kind of, of expertise then, right? But, but look, the point, look, the point here is that the people, even people who are experts, you know, they may know, you know, they may, like, you know, let's say peer review, okay? Peer review. We could have an argument about this. But people make judgments about whether articles are good or bad, okay? Um, and, and, and in a sense, their expertise is established by being able to tell the difference. But if you ask them to actually explain in what does the difference lie, what is the nature of the difference, they may come up with quite different things, yet they end up making the same judgment the judgment is expert in the knowing how sense, but there's still disagreement in the knowing that sense in terms of how they explain the judgment. And it seems to me that distinction is one of the things that I want to keep alive. I want to keep that distinction alive. You know, in other words, that there are in fact many different ways in which people end up reaching judgment, even when they're considered expert. It's not because they learned a particular definitive way of doing it. Yeah, I think you're right. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, thank you so much for the talk. It was really interesting. I have lots of points, but I will really limit it to, to two of them. The first one uh, concerns the uh, epistemology of counterfactual historiography, as you were saying in mm -hmm. the last book. And yes, I think that the counterfactual economic historiography that is made by Fogel can work and works because there is a, a kind of matrix that can be applied. I mean, you can measure the GDP now and make an hypothesis, a reasonable hypothesis about the GDP of the US without railway system mm -hmm. and so on. But concerning history of science, we have no uh, this kind of matrix. There is no 
matrix or a distinct matrix, or at least there is not something like the GDP. Okay, and then we would need other uh, proxies for doing that. I don't know, but uh, at the state of research now, I cannot imagine how can I check at least quantitatively the counterfactuals of my uh, counterfactual historiography against the, the reality. Uh, for contemporary science, I could imagine some scientometric measure, but what about 17th century science? Okay, that's the first point. And the second, about the, the last part of your presentation concerning uh, the role of academics, uh, this, this, I feel it very uh, close to my heart. <laughs> and it seems to me that your proposal is that, in a way, teaching should be more important than research, okay? Yeah. And that I agree with, but if I see uh, the, the actual policy for uh, universities in Italy, but also in UK, it goes in the other direction. The focus on research, the products you have to, to publish a thought paper in those journals and not in that journals, but basically it is a focus on, on, on research. So, I was. I would ask you if uh, I am right in saying that for you teaching is more important. And another little thing: what do you think about the so-called third mission of university? I mean, the idea that the um, university should play a role in society, for example, via knowledge uh, transfer for science, so the startups, technology, and so on. And what do you think about it? Because I think it is, in a way, it goes in your direction because, because we have to go out from the ivory tower and go into society and play a role in the society as a part of it, as an enterprise. So, what's your idea? Okay, okay, these are good questions. Um, it's interesting. Let's take the, let's take them in the order you presented them. Um, the first thing about the metrics for counterfactual history of science. Um, it's interesting you ask this question, and, and, and maybe, um, maybe this reflects just how much younger you are than I am. Um, but um, let me tell you something. When I entered into this field, um, you know, there was a lot of discussion about progress, right? How do you make progress in science? Yes. Some of you old enough may remember this, right? And, and this was out of the Popper Kuhn debates and yeah, Lakatosh and Loudon. Yeah, right. 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 All I have waited on these things. No, no, right, exactly. And, 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 and the, but the thing that was interesting about these debates, even though in a sense they never went anywhere, was that there were attempts, I mean, that, that was presupposed, you might say, that you could measure these things. Yes. Even, the, you know, and so I remember back in 1986, uh, you know, uh, when I first met Larry Loudon. Yeah, Loudon uh, has yeah, yeah, he, he, I mean, again, just to give you a sense of this, this idea is not so crazy. Back in 19, 1986, he, uh, he organized a conference at Virginia Tech, uh, called, which became this book, right, called Scrutinizing Science, which was published by Kluwer, um, you know, a couple of years later, um, where he basically brought in all kinds of historians and philosophers to talk about various cases in the history of science, and was basically trying to judge which kind of philosophy of science actually better captured, you know, some adequate notion of progress to the empirical history of science. This was something that was actually being discussed until the mid, mid late 1980s, actually, right? And, and even, and the problem, of course, was there was no agreement on the metric, right? There was no agreement on the metrics, and when this debate was really happening, Nobody was even thinking about citations or anything yes. like that, right? The citation stuff was happening, it was already there, uh, but that wasn't really hooked up into this debate where there was this kind of much more qualitative sense of how many you know, empirical problems are solved versus the number of conceptual problems generated, and you had to somehow trust the philosopher to be able to <laughs> sort this out somehow. You know? um, but the point was that this entire discussion, which was about the nature of scientific progress, Presuppose metrics were possible, okay? And, and, and I do think, you know, so I'll give you an example, again, none of this stuff was ever made sufficiently clear to get universal assent, and that's maybe why this project fell apart. But I certainly remember in the late 1980s, um, you know, when I first gave a talk at Cornell University, Richard Boyd, some of you may know about him, um, 
again, I don't know, you know, not to re rehash ancient history, but there was this view. It used to be, it's called scientific realism. I don't know if you've heard of it, but uh, it was a big thing in the 1970s and 80s. Um, and, and he was, and I remember asking him uh, about uh, what was his view of science, and he. And, and you know, in terms of this kind of real, you know, what was the historiography? Because he he claimed to be very interested in the history of science. But I said, well, what kind of historiography of science underwrites a realist point of view? And so his answer was something like this, which I think, in a way, shows these people were, were thinking this way. Um, he was saying that um, it is true that it's a historical accident that science. You know, uh, that science became the way it did, that, the science, that we had the scientific revolution, right? That this was a historical accident. Needham is right, right? The scientific revolution is a historical accident that has to do with the nature of the West. But once it took hold, because it was true, it stuck. Okay. A kind of survival, kind of a bit like the way natural selection explanations work, right? Because it was true, it stuck. It didn't have to have happened, but once we hit on it, it stuck. And of no miracle argument. Yeah, argument. yeah, and yeah. And, and, and you know, and my view, you know, my view is this is superstition, right? I mean, there's a sense in which this, this kind of account is superstition. But it was very important in underwriting the realist intuition, which claimed at the same time to be sensitive to the history of science, right? So in other words, it didn't have to have happened this way, but once it did, it stuck because it's true. And all these notions of convergent realism and approximation to the truth, all these kinds of ideas which were very much associated with scientific realism when it was really important movement, had this kind of mentality. It had this, and this is the fact, it was always in the back of my mind when, because I began thinking about this, you know, when this stuff was still around, and that's what I was saying, saying, what is, what is getting, you know, what is really animating this? Because of course, that's not a good reason. Just because, you know, it, it appears by accident and because it's stuck, it's because it's true. There are all kinds of reasons why things can stick. It could be through, you know, institutional inertia, it could be through power structures, it could be through all kinds of reasons. Right? And, and, and so, but, but the point is that there was this kind of historiographical sensibility already there in those classic debates from the history and philosophy of science. Um, uh, Okay, so the epistemic role of teaching, okay? I agree with you, right? Basically, and in fact, um, I, uh, I have a way of talking about teaching. Um, yeah, I talk about it uh, as the uh, creative destruction of social capital. Um, so the idea being that when you do research, when you do research, especially if it's innovative research, um, there's a sense in which what you've done is you've created social capital in a sense, right? Because you've created an advantage. You've created an advantage that is for you, the person who did it, the people who funded it, and those who have easiest access to the knowledge because they already have done pretty, they've studied all the things you've studied, so they can read your peer review article. They know exactly what you're talking about. And, and when we're talking about any given field, there are relatively few people who actually fit into that category. That is to say, people who are in a position to take advantage of new knowledge, right? It's a so new research, if it's really new research, really in the, at the outset benefits relatively few people. If you're a true Democrat, that's a prima facie argument against innovation. However, that's not where the story ends, right? Because university is more than just producing research, it is also teaching. And this is where, you know, I, this is my interpretation of the kind of Humboldtian idea of the unity of teaching and research, right? That your obligation, right, once you've done this original research, that in the, at the outset, relatively few people can understand or have access to, that then you have an obligation to make it more generally available. And that's the creative destruction part, because what you're destroying is the initial advantage that people who can read the peer review articles have. You're destroying that advantage in the classroom by making it easier for people who do not have that educational background to be able to make sense of what you're saying, what, what's being said in the research. And that's the creative destruction. Because what that does then is it opens up, you might say, the pool of people who in the future can take forward that knowledge. 
So in other words, you're, o you're opening it up to people who did not necessarily go through the same education you and the other people who read your articles go through. You're opening it up to a different set of people, the people in your classroom, okay? And so to my mind, you know, if you're really doing teaching right, you're, you're fulfilling the third mission of the university, right? And, and I think it's a kind of, it gives you a sense of, of how people think about teaching that these two things aren't seen as more closely connected, right? Because I do think there is a sense in which we tend to think about teaching as the reproduction of expertise. And that's why teaching, in fact, has a diminished status in the university, because the research is where the real action is, Right, and the teaching is just an, a kind of reproduction, a kind of Xerox copy of what the research does, right? Um, but in fact, no, it is in fact the third mission of the university is be, should be enacted in the classroom. That should, in fact, that is the ideal place to do it because you have a captive audience, yes. right? That is the ideal place to do it. You shouldn't need to have a third mission of the university if teaching were done effectively. Okay, that's, so now the last thing you asked about was, um, let me see, I think that was it. Then yeah, that was it. Yeah, so I've done it. Yeah, yeah. You, sir. Yeah, I just want to push you a little bit more on his question, the first question, which was a really good question, and I, I kind of feel that you didn't answer. Um, I mean, let me rephrase it, but I think the gist is the same. Uh, I mean, during your talk, you were switching uh, between macro and micro versions of your thesis. Uh, rather freely, and that I think suits you in a number of ways because you know your approach to you know your, your claim that we should ask and answer presumably these counterfactual questions about the history of science um, is most plausible at the extreme ends of the macro and the micro level. Um, and let me explain why. I mean, you know, well, in a sense, you have explained why already at the very macro level, even Richard Boyd agrees that science might not have happened, okay? So if the question is, could there be an alternative form of life? Of course, and even nowadays, you know, we can all see that science is not inevitable. Half of Americans or whatever believe in creationism, you know, so, you know, that's obvious. Now, at the micro level, the very micro level, if the question you're asking is, was Einstein inevitable? Again, the answer is pretty obviously no, I mean, we now know, I mean, physicists know that you know, Einstein's theory is one of a rather large family of field theories. And we can imagine pretty easily that you know, somebody else in a different place, uh, using slightly different experimental data, could have come up with another theory of the same family, but maybe not that one. Okay? But that's, the idea is that that would still be science. Okay? Now, the really difficult questions are the ones in the middle. Okay? And why are they difficult? Because there you have to decide what is your metrics. When you're asking, you know, when you're wondering about another alternative field theory than Einstein's, you're taking for granted and fixed a whole number of criteria, um, methods, whatever, to evaluate the success or not success or whatever it is that these people are doing. Right? When you're in the middle, it's really difficult to say. Um, so you're an expert of creationism, for example. You know that's one of the areas where this issue comes up very clearly. You know, um, evolutionary theorists say that these guys are not doing science, and you know we can see that maybe you know if science and science or whatever had gone their way, then there would have been maybe less carbon dating techniques, um, less uh, digging in under the ground. <laughs> You know, a lot of things, and then you say, hmm, now, would that be alternative science, or yeah. would that be an alternative form of life? And that's where you need the metrics. Otherwise, these questions are horribly difficult to answer. I yeah. mean, you know, you could just say, yeah, things would have been otherwise. Yeah, sure. But, no, but, this, but that's obvious. Yeah, yeah. That's, the void, that's the void answer, right? I agree with you, but, <clears throat> but, but I do think this is why I made an emphasis on the rewinding that in a sense to be, to figure, because there is a question about what exactly is the problematic issue, like uh, with creationism. You know, what exactly is the problem with creationism? I think a lot of people have a lot of different answers. And if you, ha if you wanted to rewind the history, people would start at different points in history as to say where the problem begins, right? Uh, 
And, and I think that's where, in a sense, you can't really get the, this is where, where I think Vogel is right, that you really can't get a counterfactual analysis off the ground unless you get to a point in the past that, that you can agree on where it could have been otherwise. So in other words, with regard to creationism, depending on what your problem is with creationism, and people have many different problems, right, you would go to a particular period in time where there was, it, was, it was kind of a, a dividing line where people either supported, you know, a divine creator or not, and it mattered subsequently in terms of how the science developed, and you'd go to that point in time, and then you imagine, okay, how would have things been different had things not gone the way of the evolutionists back then at that point in time, right? So you have to, you have to actually figure out a point in time. Right, but then how do you answer the question? I mean, because if the question is Boyd's question, right? Yeah. Then you say yes, and then you wouldn't have biology anymore, right? Um, and, and, you know, everybody yeah. agrees with that. Yeah, but, but I think the, the thing that Boyd is, Boyd is trading on, he's trading on a kind of mix of an under and an over-determinist view to his advantage, right? So in other words, he accepts the underdeterminist view that, yeah, it didn't have to be that way, Right, but then he says, "Well, but once it is that way, it has to go here." So he's imagining that, in some sense, it's overdetermined. Okay, and I'm saying you need to split those things apart. That you could go back to a point in the past, okay, where where you say, "Look, it didn't have to go this way," and you have to imagine that things may, it may or may not. It's an open question, empirical question, may have gone in a radically different direction. So, I, so in other words, this is something that actually historians could argue about. And, and, and I think this is where looking at the, what economic historians do is kind of a useful kind of practice. Now, the thing that they have on their side, which I will grant you, is that they do have some relatively agreed metrics on the table already, like GDP and, and so forth. Yes, that's true. That's true. And that's what, and, I, and I, would, I would locate the problem for what I'm saying there. You know, uh, in other words, that, that this, you might say, is implicitly a kind of... Uh, you know, call for getting a little more quantitative agreement yes. on how we talk about things like progress and, you know, insofar as these notions, because I do think most of our normative notions about science imply things like this. That's the other point too, right? This would, this issue, the reason why I'm raising all this is because we actually do think that science is the most important, the best, whatever form of knowledge by some criteria or other. And what the counterfactual analysis does is in a sense forces you to kind of, you might say, come clean on measuring by what degree, by how much, by, you know, what is it about it, right? Which then goes to the question of, of, of a kind of, towards a kind of quantitative causal analysis. So in other words, I am, I'm actually supporting that, you know, so, 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 and this is where one might want to look at citations, you know, in some way, I don't think one can interpret them naively, but, but there's a sense in which there's probably something to look at there. I mean, I'm gonna, I would recommend a book, by the way, that I think in a way has a lot of the resources one needs to think about stuff like this. Let me get her. Um, and, and again, um, older people might remember this. Mark de May. I don't know if it, does that name mean anything to anyone? He's a Belgian philosopher of science. He wrote a book in 1982, 1982, called The Cognitive Paradigm. And that book is really interesting because it kind of, he's a very broad thinking kind of guy and, and he actually lays out, he, he looks at scientometrics and he looks at all sorts of other quantitative measures, but he's also coming at this from the standpoint of a person who's quite steep in you know, the history and philosophy of science as we normally understand it. Um, and he tries to kind of give some, some perspective, you might say. And, and, and this is part of a, you know, this kind of idea of science of science. Yes. The idea of science of science is this kind of idea that was floating around in the, mainly in the middle third of the 20th century, little, it still existed. You, 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 I mean, I yeah. remember that Popper really criticized that. Yeah, he was, yeah, yeah. Kind of the Soviet Union. And well, this is the thing, yeah. I mean, this is the, yeah, people like Popper, who, you know, who, who, as you may know, I'm a big fan of Popper, but I do think he's got this kind of very schizophrenic attitude, because on the one hand, he does talk the talk of approximating the truth. Yes. He certainly is one of the people talking about that, but he doesn't want to commit himself to any serious metrics. And so you wonder, what does that mean, right? What is that about? How can you have both, right? You, you need to, if you're going to, talk, so, so I'm willing to kind of bite the bullet and say, well, let's think about metrics. Yeah. Yes, sir. 
Um, so maybe it's a clarificatory question. So it's about the the role of um, academia, the, the role that you see for academia. So if, if I understand it correctly, you were saying that um, we should find new ways of presenting research to either the students, if it's uh, about teaching, or in any case, the general public, uh, so that teaching is not rehearsing, but it's actually presenting the research. You know? um, the reason why I would like you to say a little bit more about this is that I have a worry. So, um, in the process of research, part of um, the process of guaranteeing that the research is good quality is that first the research goes to the community of the Islamic peers and it's um, worked into some kind of consensus, maybe not perfect, but in a sense it, it goes to the peers. Um, you know, it, it would be a very bad practice if um, some uh, biochemists uh, came up with some really groundbreaking research and it went directly, if it happens, but usually there are bad side effects of that happening when some new research goes directly to the public or um, maybe to the students. So could you clarify what you mean by um, you know, teaching in a different way, or presenting research directly to, to, to the public? Well, I'm talking about stuff that uh, in a way has already been published. That's my, the primary context, okay? I'm talking about stuff that's already been published or, or stuff that one is working on. And the idea would be to ask, so, so, I mean, uh, Yeah, but even that, no, but see, but once uh, it's published, it still needs to go through a, quite a long process of being Look, I, I, let me, let me, yeah. so as, not to get into too many arguments at once, it's true I'm not peer review's biggest friend, but I don't really want to talk about that here. I want to respond to the question in a more specific way, uh, namely that even if we accept peer review, okay, even if we accept peer review as the basis for knowledge in terms of how it gets published and so forth. So in other words, let's say I agree with you that you shouldn't go to the media to present your findings before you've gone through peer review. Let's, let's agree with this. Um, there is still a question about how it's presented in the classroom after that. Okay, and the question is whether you present it in a way that basically compels the student to reproduce the process by which you came to it in terms of all the knowledge that you had in advance before you reached your conclusion. That's the question as far as this issue is concerned. We could talk about peer review at another time, but the point is let's accept peer review. Does that mean that I have to, do I have to reproduce in the classroom a version of what it is that I published through peer review? My answer is no, you're doing something different. In fact, what you're doing is something closer to deconstructing it by making it more easily available so people don't have to go through that process. In other words, you're enacting the fact that the peer review process is just one path to the knowledge that you've come up with. That's the point I'm trying to drive home in teaching. We can have an argument about peer review on another day, but I don't want to get that confused. Okay? Yes, sir. Um, just about uh, reverse engineering pedagogy. I mean, one of the reasons a discipline teaches its history is because if you know the steps through which you've reached some plane, you basically also know the frailties of that reasoning. So you can know, well, actually, that concept came from a totally different context, perhaps it doesn't apply, and all these things. So that history, in a way, is British so censorship. It's good, so it's also some kind of prudence to those, those claims. So in, the point, in, in your idea of this reverse engineering, what kind of role would you see in this history? How would you teach the end results without, I mean, giving a feel for these frailties without going through this history? Yeah, no, well, look, I mean, I do think there is, I mean, you know, I, I mentioned Kuhn earlier. Uh, I mean, one of the things that Kuhn had in mind, which I think is quite right, is that there is a radical, it's radically different how the history of physics is taught from the way the history of philosophy is taught in terms of issues like this, you know, um, that, that the history of physics does tend to actually censor or, or eliminate, right, uh, especially foundational questions that can be asked until there is some kind of empirical payoff that ends up helping the established paradigm, okay? Um, but in other fields, of course, 
I mean, um, I mean, it's interesting because because there's there, there 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 are certain fields that are sort of in the you might say in the borderline between a humanities and natural science approach. Let's say economics, and and there's often a very big uh, battle from the curriculum committee standpoint as, in terms of the extent to which the actual history of economics should be taught to you know economic students. Because the actual history of economics, of course, presents a much kind of wider range of theories and controversies and so forth than the ones that are likely to be, you know, part of what is the received wisdom at the moment. Um, and and often what happens, I mean, is that that the that that this doesn't sit well with the with the departments themselves. So in other words, I believe in teaching a very kind of open history that shows all the problems with all the different views and how they were raised and so forth. I mean, uh, you know, so for example, uh, to give you a sense of what I'm sympathetic to when I first started working on this is you may know, um, if you know something of uh, history of physics, right, Ernst Mach's Science of Mechanics. Okay, Science of Mechanics it's called the science of mechanics, but what the book is, is kind of a, in effect, a history of all the opposition to Newtonian mechanics, right, into the 19th century that never quite gets answered. So in other words, he's trying to presenting the history as setting up a field of problems for students to kind of pursue. Now this was a very unpopular way of presenting the history of physics, because he was making it look as though the foundations are always up for grabs in some sense. Now this, this book actually influenced Einstein and the early founders of quantum mechanics. They read this book and then Mach became a kind of heroic figure. But in his time he was seen as a complete pariah, a complete outlier, because he was, he was presenting the science of his own field as one with an essentially contested history. Now this is something that we take for granted maybe in philosophy and humanistic subjects. But, but he did this for physics, okay? And it was regarded very controversially. My view is that he was doing the right thing. My point is, this is how you would treat, teach the history of physics, would be like this. To show, to keep on reminding people of all of these open foundational questions. So I can... You wouldn't skip the path. What? You wouldn't skip the path. No. I think we have time yeah. just for another question, okay. but you'll be a little bit late. Okay. Yes, sir. You said buy and switch. Yeah. And you know that there are many examples in the history of science, for example, the most important, Galilei, that uh, um, he said he did some experiments, but he didn't. Right. Yeah. And the other said he was alive. Right? Yeah. So do you think that? Galilei is a scientist. He's not out of science. So do you think lies are part of the science? Sure. I mean, <laughs> I, I, to me, it's not contro that's not so controversial. I mean, um, and in fact, I would say that if you look at the, you know, so the field I'm associated with in, 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 in this general science study, science and technology studies, right? One of the things that they're always pointing out to is the, uh, the difference between the way in which research is actually done and the way it's written up for publication that ends up becoming the authoritative version of the knowledge, right? There's always this difference that takes place. Now you might say, well scientists are basically in the business of constantly covering up their tracks and lying and presenting things much more strongly than they really are, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, and yeah, in a sense, you want to call that lying? that it's lying, right? In other words, that the, the sort of thing that is represented in the typical scientific article is not a natural account of what actually takes place in the research concerned. So there is this discrepancy already built into the process, okay? And one can justify it in various ways. So just because something isn't true to the original doesn't mean it's necessarily so bad. But it could be seen as lying, yeah. It could be seen as lying, right? And, and, and uh, you know, and that's the interesting thing, right? Um, that, for example, it may be that someone writes about something they didn't really do, which is true, they didn't do it, but someone else reading what they say may be able to do it and then build on it, 
right? That's kind of how Galileo managed to get into business, right? It wasn't because of anything he did, but, but he wrote about it in a way that got other people to be able to do it. And that's enough for signs to make progress. So, you know, and, and Mendel, Gregor Mendel is another example. I mean, there are all these cases in the history of science where we have good reason to believe that the people did not do what they said they did, but nevertheless, other people built on what they thought they did, and they managed to make progress. So lying is indeed constitutive of scientific progress. Of course. It's just, you know, what moral weight we give to that is a, is a matter. And when we decide these matters is another thing. But we have to live with that. So, so I'll leave the matter there. Yeah. Yeah. So. Thank you very much, Steve, and thank you to the audience. And so let me just remind you that uh, our next meeting will be on April 12th uh, at 2.30, and the speaker will be Vincenzo De Risi, who will speak about space and figure, foundations of geometry and diagrammatic inferences in early modern mathematics.